All right, welcome to CCNA one uh, or I saw two hundred four or whatever you want to call it. I am going to start off on the web page just in case some of you aren't figuring out how to do it. I have multiple classes here. You will only have one right now. So you will click your ISADI 204, 204 Fall 16 and it will come into here and it'll look a little different than this because I haven't actually launched this class yet but for the chapters you go to modules here um, for the assignments you go to assignments so any tests quizzes uh, or I believe quizzes I guess just tests in here um, if you go back to the modules the quizzes are under there or you can do the chapter tests through there okay so to launch the chapter we're just going to click launch chapter and it brings up this beautiful little screen and we're going to click that okay so in this lecture I am you still need to read this I just go over the basics and I give you a little bit of uh, real world experience if I can and I kind of tell you what you're expected to know uh, for the CCNA exam or the CSEN exam. Uh, I give you examples of why some of this is good to know throughout these lectures for test questions and uh, other than that I'm just telling you why I think everything's valuable so make sure you go through and read the rest of this. Alright so in this chapter um, chapter one of all of these kind of start out and don't feel overwhelmed because they throw a lot of information. I think the first two chapters of CCNA 1 um, is basically a review on what you're going to be studying. And so, I don't know, here we, just, here we start uh, exploring the network, right? So after this chapter, we're supposed to be able to explain how networks affect the way we interact, learn, work, and play, describe how networks support communication, explain the concept of, con of a converged network, Describe the four basic requirements of a reliable network. Explain the use of network devices. Compare the devices and topologies of LAN to the devices and topology of WAN. Explain the basic structure of the Internet. Explain how LANs and WANs interconnect to the Internet. Describe the impact of BYOD, online collaboration, video, and cloud computing on a business network. Explain how network networking technologies are changing the home environment, identify some basic security threats and solutions for both small and large networks, explain how the three Cisco enterprise architectures work to meet the needs of an evolving network environment. Oh wow, it sounds like we're doing a lot today, but I'll try to keep it short. If it gets too long, uh, break it up into a few times of listening. All right, so there's going to be these little uh, activities here. In, you're welcome to draw them or do whatever. I'm just going to skip through them on the lecture. All right, so networking today and a video. You should probably check that out. So we're going to go to then and now. All right, so what we have, fixed computing, mobile, BYOD, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything. These are phases. Um, throughout the years, as you can see, um, which this mobility BYOD, I think it's still coming in today, but I guess we can just call it the Internet of Everything. Um, so what has changed? We post and share photographs, home videos, experiences. Uh, we can access and submit schoolwork online. Uh, you guys know that because that's what we're doing here. Communicate with friends and family and peers using email, instant messaging, or internet phone calls. Watch videos, play online games, decide what to wear using online current weather conditions. Find the, the least congested route to our destination. Check our bank accounts. All right, basically we use the internet for everything and on all devices. That's great, right? We'll keep going on. It's just general information like this uh, right in here. Um, so networking the global community basically networking has allowed the world to be a global economy rather than a small area as it's very easy to communicate with other countries globally okay so how is it changing the way we learn virtual classrooms collaborative learning spaces on-demand video mobile learning okay well it's changing it with being able to do stuff like this um, 
but Cisco also makes actual classrooms that are just purely based on on as you can see in this screen people actually sit in a class and there is a video camera they bought a company called Movi and that's what they're doing there and I, I don't know how to really sum up these other ones uh, but yeah it's it's changing everything including learning okay so the ways we communicate you guys probably already know instant messaging texting social media collaborative tools um, web blogs also known as blogs wikis podcasting and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing alright so I'm not gonna read let's see I assume most people know what texting is social media we're talking about Facebook Twitter LinkedIn those kind of things collaborative tools this would be stuff like GoToMeeting and other uh, voice over IP or video over IP uh, solutions that allow us to communicate well, among the masses blogs I don't know, I guess people like writing about their lives on the internet and other people like reading them. Alright, wikis, pretty sure everybody knows what Wikipedia is, so we're going to keep moving on from there. Uh, podcasting, I don't know, I, I don't know if people still even do that. It's like, a, isn't that an iTunes thing? Alright, so peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, we're going to go over it more, but it is... It's associated with bad things, but it's not always bad. It just means that you're not you're not going to a centralized server. It's just uh, normally in networking, we uh, have some computers and they go to a server and we draw that. I don't know, kind of like this, right? So we have a server right here, bam, and it's connected to this is a switch. Those are arrows, by the way. Okay. And so then we have a client computer and another one. Oh yeah, that's great artwork. Okay. And so peer to peer is not this. This is client server model. And so these clients go to this server for whatever they want, uh, such as a website. They always go here. Now peer to peer is the opposite where we could just have a bunch of computers and they say hey I have that file so this computer tells this computer I have that file and that's peer-to-peer -peer. And, it, and it's associated a lot of times with things like I don't know Napster or I don't know let's see uh, BitTorrent that kind of thing uh, that is kind of frowned upon but it's not always an illegal it's just you're not using a client server model okay Okay, so how does networking change the way we work? Well, it allows us to uh, telecommute. And so you could, I mean, you form what's called a VPN or virtual private network into your company from your home, and you can work from afar, or we use stuff like GoToMeeting, and we no longer have to pay, I don't know, couple hundred to a thousand bucks to fly somewhere for a meeting we can have the meeting right in our own office and deal with it that way uh, network support the way we play alright so I think most students in this program understand that uh, we can watch videos online gaming I'm sure nobody does that uh, shop online and Instant message, everything else. So they love instant messaging in this chapter. All right. Feel free to read through that if you need a better explanation. All right. So we have different sizes of networks, right? So we have our small home network, and, that, and that's not really what this class is uh, is based on, right? This this class is based on oh more medium. CCNA is based for more medium to large networks, uh, a little bit of small home offices, but our typical home network, right, we have a computer and this wireless router that's, that it has wires on it, it acts as a router, it acts as a wireless access point, and it has, acts as a switch all together. 
where we start going to a small office home network we might have a switch and a router separately and maybe the router is an integrated services router so it does some wireless and that kind of thing um, and then when we start going to these medium and large we have lots of switches and probably several routers connecting different areas um, and so then we go to our worldwide networks and this is where we have uh, wide area network connections or or WAN connections or internet VPNs that connect remote sites to one another. Um, anyhow, we'll keep moving on. Alright, so now we're back to our client server model. Kind of like what I talked about before but drawn better. Okay, and so in a normal model we have we have an email, right? An email client. These are usually just an application, so most of these are like the file client, the web client, the email client can all run on one computer, but they're making it easier. And so, where does the email client go? It goes to an email server to request emails, all right? The web client goes to the web server, the file client goes to the file server, and so that's client and servers, right? These are the requests where the end users are, this is where the data is stored, right? That's what a server is doing, is it's running a service such as file server, web server, or email server um, and storing the files. Um, so I guess what they're trying to show you here is kinda like what I was saying before multiple clients can run multiple applications and one server can run multiple services for those client servers. All right, so here's the opposite, our peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay, so as you can see, there's not a dedicated server to do this. All right, um, it's we're going to share, and we're probably sharing this printer over USB or something like that. Um, and I guess this guy is just sharing files now. Why a server is better is we regularly don't turn on a server or turn off a server. It's always on, and so we don't have to worry about things coming off. Now, if you were to turn off either of these computers, your peer to peer network is broken. You no longer have a file server, you no longer have a printer if you were to turn this one off. And so it's different. And it's also a client server, as we scale in size, um, is much more efficient than peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, the more you have in your peer-to-peer -peer network, the more complicated it gets. And so, uh, what Cisco is saying is the advantages to peer-to-peer -peer networks are easy to set up, less complexity, lower costs since network devices and dedicated servers may not be required, can be used for simple tasks such as transferring files and sharing printers. The diff disadvantage, no centralized administration, not secure, not scalable. All devices act as both client and server, which slow their performance. Okay, so that's what I was kind of talking about. As we scale, it gets slower and slower. Also, um, to set someone up, we have to go here to this computer to set a new printer up, set somebody up for sharing. Um, same with this file server. We have to go, so if we had 50 people, we'd have to go there 50 times or... Right. or as we expand, so we start out with 20, we put 20 on at first, and then as we go, uh, we have to go to each one of these devices and add 30 here and add 30 here if we went up to 50, and so it's kind of a pain, whereas if we went to this model, uh, we would just have to add them once for email, web server, and file sharing. We could all we could do it at once instead of being on different machines. Um, that is the nice thing about client server. Okay, so... Now we're on to components of a network, and these are the very basics. Okay, so we have devices, all right? So devices are all of these things, all right? Like the servers, the computers, this is an IP phone. This is the representation from Cisco as a switch. These are represented as routers, um, switch, server, computer, phone. So. Uh, store that because it's not going away. Then we have this stuff called media. And so if we click the media, that's our wires, okay? So we have different types of media, but media is just how we connect these devices together. So um, stuff like copper, fiber, 
wireless, right? That's that's our media um, in our networks. And then we have services. And so our services would be um, what's running our software on our clients, our services that those that software is accessing on our servers um, and this is doing this is saying processing and services so uh, the service to forward traffic out of this switch um, the operating system on the switch and if we're setting up security the rules to that security alright so let's see what else we have to say about end devices. Alright, so end devices. Once again it says computers, workstations, laptops, file servers, web servers, network printers, voice over IP phones or VoIP phones, telepresence endpoints, um, which is just cameras, uh, security cameras, mobile handheld devices such as smartphones, tablets, PDAs, and wireless debit card readers, and barcode scanners, uh, also known as point of sale. Okay, so that's our end devices. Intermediary devices. Don't worry, this word is only important for the test for this chapter. You probably will never hear any intermediary dev network devices again because we start breaking them down. Um, and so they're saying network access, which is this is how we get onto the network. This is what our computers, whenever you hear access, that means where our end devices are connecting to, so we say switches and wireless access points. Um, so are we connecting through copper or fiber optic or are we are connecting through wireless? That's our switches would connect us through uh, probably copper and then wireless access point, as you probably guessed, connects us to the wireless network. Internetworking devices. Okay, so internetworking means connecting different networks and so this would be the routers. Routers job is to connect different networks and route to those different networks. And then we have security which are firewalls and sometimes firewalls are built into net, into routers or sometimes they are their own uh, hardware appliance. Uh, this right now because we're talking about devices it's talking about hardware firewalls not software firewalls such as Windows firewall or some antivirus firewall. Alright, so network media. I kind of talked about this already. We have copper, which is probably what you're used to. Um, and so with copper cables, uh, they are all of these, or fiber optic and the copper could both be Ethernet. So Ethernet cables, not a. I, I guess we could call them Ethernet cables, but. Um, these are RJ45 connected cables, which if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, there's a whole chapter on it. Uh, this is just a run through. We have fiber optic, right? So uh, there's two types of fiber optic. There is glass and there is LED, and LED is basically just plastics. Um, and so they're just shooting light from one end to the other in different frequencies and picking them up, whereas in copper, we're using electricity to transmit different frequencies to uh, get ones and zeros to build a a frame or I don't want to go too far but to get our data and so then wireless we're using uh, microwave signals normally to get, get our ones and zeros and build our data Network representation. Okay, so here's our. Uh, my drawings aren't quite as good as what they're showing, but so we have desktop computer, laptop, printer, telepresence endpoint, wireless tablet, IP phone, wireless router, uh, LAN switch, router, multi-layer switch, firewall appliance. This stands for wireless. This is a LAN media. This is a WAN media, which we will talk about more in the future. Okay, so why is this important? Just a second, and I... Alright, the reason this is important is because in the not-so-distant future, we are going to be running a program known as Packet Tracer. And as you can see, all of those uh, icons uh, are represented. I haven't put all of them in there, but uh, you can find them in here. Uh, 
and so you click through here and I, I'll have a, another explanation about this when we get closer but you can download this and we can actually program all of this stuff uh, this is what we'll be doing later in this class this is what you're actually learning is uh, how to run some of these devices and this is actually what it looks like to program them in real life uh, and this is just a uh, virtual program where we will be setting up networks and so uh, when I ask you to put some routers and that kind of thing on uh, it's going to be important to know what the icon looks like all right so moving on topology and diagrams all right so we can do physical topology diagrams and logical right so physical is the physical location of intermediary devices configure ports and cable installation now logical identified device ports in the IP addressing scheme which is what we'll soon be doing so this is a logical and this is a physical and when I draw it's a look kind of a mix of a logical and a physical together um, I don't go this extreme that way um, I'm usually closer to this, but I'm putting IP addresses inside your graphic, and most people I know combine both both physical and logical as well when they draw. Feel free to um, to uh, do these activities, but I'm going to skip through them. All right, so now we have types of internet. Okay, so LAN. Maybe you've heard of this LAN, and so what does that mean? Local area network, and so. What is that really? Well, a local area network is, there's many of them on this page. So the first part, this is actually a LAN. Anywhere we see switches, switches build LANs. And so this right here is a LAN, and that went way off. Um, and since this is an access point, this is a representation for an access point. This home office, this is also LAN. So, it's your internal network. It's the network that your computers are connected. Your home network is a LAN. Um, uh, LCSE, if you're on their local network, if you're inside their switch network, you're on the LAN. Um, and actually, this one can go clear out here. That's probably the LAN. Now, as you can see, these are routers connecting, and, and this is a router technology. It just doesn't look like it. And so it's connecting to the internet and all that jazz. And so um, where these connections go across, these are WAN connections, wide area network. And so, how do we define a WAN? A network infrastructure that provides access to other networks over a wide geographical area. Okay, so this is where this could be across town, across the state, across the country, or across the world. Those could all be. WAN technologies, okay, and and so that's kind of the basics of those two, and those are the two that we uh, focus on. But there are other. So we have a MAN, a metropolitan metropolitan area network, and what a MAN is, it, it's like the city of Lewiston connecting all these fiber, and so it's a large area that allows you to use high speed connections. Um, over e usually Ethernet, um, you can get high-speed internet connections over Ethernet rather than your typical uh, internet connections. Um, and so, and Cisco's definition is a network infrastructure that spans a physical area larger than a LAN but smaller than a WAN. How broad could you get there? MANs are typically operated by a single entity such as a large organization. Um, then we have a wireless LAN, and so or a WLAN, similar to a LAN, but wirelessly interconnects the users and endpoints. That was this top home office one. That's a wireless LAN. And then we have a storage area network, and that's not actually on here. And most of these that we see here, the WANs aren't, but uh, LANs, MANs, and wireless LANs usually run over Ethernet, and WANs run on a different long range, uh, different encapsulations and then a SAN does as well and what a SAN is doing is it's a network where if we had so what a SAN is is this server right here it we want redundancy uh, 
with storage and so we connect storage to my really bad switch right here and it's a switch that's not connected to the LAN it's not connected to the WAN all it is doing is connecting servers to we're gonna say that's storage and this is storage okay and so it's very convenient in virtualization and you'll study it more in virtualization but it's running um, it through the network this it uses either fiber channel or iSCSI which are two different protocols rather than Ethernet that connect the server to disk drives and so it the server believes through the network it is connected similar to its internal hard drives it, so it would be like your computer being connected to a hard drive now not over file sharing is different than this this is where you're actually uh, block level data so anyhow so what what does Cisco say about LANs? LANs interconnect inner devices or interconnect end devices in a limited area such as a home, school, office building, or campus. A LAN is usually administrated by a single organization or an individual. The administrative control that governs the security and access control policies are enforced on the network level, provides high speed bandwidth to internal devices and intermediary devices. Okay, so why do they say high speed? Okay, because in your home network, say this is your home network. Um, typically your internet connection is slower. Now that's kind of changing nowadays, but our, our switches in the, let's say this is your home network. Our switches normally um, are 100 megabytes on each connector per second or a gig. Um, which is a thousand megabytes uh, where our internet connection I don't know if you're using cable one I guess you can get a hundred meg but probably if you did a speed test you're not doing that so typically our transfers inside of our LAN are faster than through the internet that's why we put servers in the LAN rather than putting them uh, I mean some people do put them in the cloud but usually our transfers are faster in our internal network Okay, so now we have a wide area network. So we're connecting remote sites here, um, or connecting LANs. WANs usually connect LANs. So WANs interconnect LANs over a wide geographical area, such as between cities, states, providence, countries, or continents. WANs are usually administrated by multiple service providers. WANs typically provide slower speed links than LANs. Alright, the internet. Now what's the difference between the internet and a WAN? So a WAN, when we say a WAN, that's usually a private link connecting two different sites. Um, whereas the internet is made up of mo lots and lots of networks. And if you see, this is the cloud. That's what the cloud means, is it's a bunch of networks that we don't necessarily, we can't define them. They're Someone else is managing them, and so we don't use them. But the internet is just a lot of networks connected that are public and we can get to whereas a WAN typically when we're talking about WANs um, they're a private link for a company over a from one site to another typically when we say WANs but as this says LANs and WANs may be connected into internetworks making the internet alright alright so now we have intranet and extranet. All right. So the internet is the public network, and then an extranet is on the public network, but you have to log into it typically. All right. But you can get to it from the public, and then the intranet is inside your LAN. And so the inter intranet is, I don't know, a lot of times time clocks are stored on intranet or company resources. Or on the intranet, um, and you're not going to get there from the internet. Um, whereas an extranet is kind of an intranet, but it's you can get there from the internet. All right, and the internet anyone can get there, right? Okay. So now we have internet access technologies. 
Connecting remote users to the internet. All right, so we have these connections, right? So we have cable right here, such as cable one, typically offered by cable television service providers. The internet data signal is carried on the same coaxial cable that delivers cable television. It provides high bandwidth, always on connection to the internet. A special cable modem sep separates the internet data signal from the other signals carried on the cable that provides an ethernet connection to a host or LAN. Then we have DSL, all right? Provides high speed bandwidth always on connection to the internet. It requires a special high speed modem that separates the DSL signal from the telephone signal. And that's why I don't know why they didn't say that there, but it's usually provided by telecommunication companies. Um, and provides an ethernet connection to a host computer or LAN. DSL runs over telephone line with the line split into three channels. One channel is used for voice telephone calls. This channel allows an individual to receive phone calls without disconnecting from the internet. A second channel is a faster download channel used to receive information from the internet. The third is the channel for sending or uploading information. This channel is usually slightly slower than the download channel. The quality and speed of the DSL connection depends mainly on the quality of the phone line and the distance from your comp phone company's central office. The further away you are, the slower the connection. Cellular, all right, so off of our telephones. Cellular, and actually they have access points that feed this as well. Cellular internet access uses a cell phone network to connect wherever you can get a cellular signal. You can get a cellular internet access. You blah, you can get cellular internet access. Great. Well, I'm glad we can. If we're going to talk about it. performance, will be limited by the capabilities of the phone and the cell tower to which it is connected. The availability of cellular access is a real benefit in those areas that would otherwise have no internet connectivity at all, or for those that constantly are on the go. Satellite. Satellite service is a good option for homes or offices that do not have access to DSL or cable. Um, actually, in the real world, satellite, it, it's getting better, but because you're shooting to space, it is very slow. And so it's usually your emergency, unless we have this dial-up weird stuff that probably a lot of people here have never experienced. All right, so back to... Satellite. Satellite dishes require a clear line of sight to the satellite and so might be difficult in heavily wooded areas or places with overhead obstruction. Speeds will vary depending on contract, though they are generally good. Equipment and installation costs can be high. Check with the provider with moderate monthly fees thereafter. The availability of satellite internet access is a real benefit in those areas that would otherwise have no internet connectivity at all. And so what they're saying is if you don't have anything else, satellite will be okay. And it is a little bit better than dial-up. So dial-up, an inexpensive option that uses any phone line and a modem to connect to the ISP. A user calls the ISP access phone number. The low bandwidth provided by dial-up modem connectivity is usually not sufficient for large data transfer, although it is useful for mobile access while traveling. All right. We're going to move on from there. Connecting businesses to the internet. So how do businesses actually connect? Well, three. We have this would be this dedicated lease line is what I call a WAN connection. So this is a dedicated connection from the service provider to the customer presence. Premise. Leased lines are actually reserved circuits that connect geographical separated offices for private voice and or data networking the circuits are typically rented at a monthly or yearly rate which tends to make it expensive in north america common lease line circuits are t1 which is 1.54 megabytes and this would be up and down t3 44.7 megabytes while in other parts of the world there are available in e1 and e3 okay we can also go into the ECs, um, which is fiber. Um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It's not EC, it's OC, okay? 
um, which are fiber optics that are faster than that. Okay, so now we have this MAN connection, the Metro Ethernet. Metro Ethernet is a typically available from a provider to a customer pre premise over a dedicated copper or fiber connection providing bandwidth speeds of 10 meg to 10 gig. Ethernet over copper EOC is more economical than fiber. Ethernet service in many cases quite widely is quite wildly available. Alright, I don't know why they're saying it. It reaches speeds of up to 40 meg. However, Ethernet over copper is limited by distance. Fiber optic Ethernet service delivers the fastest connections available at an economical price per megabit. Unfortunately, there are still many areas where the service is unavailable. Okay, so then we have business DSL, and they also have business cable. I don't know why they leave it out. So business DSL is available in various formats. A popular choice is symmetric digital subscriber line SDSL, which is similar to asymmetric digital subscriber line ADSL. Okay, so ADSL is what you typically have at home where SDSL is for business. And so what it means is ADSL asymmetric means that you're going to have a faster download rate than upload rate. Just like if you have DSL or cable at home, it's usually asymmetric. Um, and so your download is a lot faster than your upload. Now with the business with servers, you need this SDSL, the symmetric, and so that means that your upload and download rates are going to be the same. So let's go on. ADSL is des designed to deliver bandwidth at rates downstream, at different rates downstream than upstream. For example, a customer getting internet access may have downstream rates from 1.5 to 9 meg, whereas upstream bandwidth ranges from 16 to 640k upload. All right, so this is a little dated. I, you know, and I know that we can get uh, ADSL faster than that. But anyhow, that's ASD ADSL. So ADSL transmits work at distances up to 5,488 meters or 18,000 feet over a single copper twisted pair and they didn't talk about the SDSL as much but the SDSL just means the rates are the same okay satellite satellite service can provide a connection when a wired solution is not available satellite dishes require a clear line of sight just like they did when we read it before so you can do satellite to different businesses Okay, and what they're showing here is all these DSL lines are, or all these connections are going from site to site. You see the internet over here, so they don't want you to have, uh, they're kind of, these are all going as a WAN connection where it's just providing a connection from this, oh, I guess it's the, this organization to the internet service provider, and so these lines get you there and then they actually connect into the internet. So I guess it would be giving you internet access, but I'm just showing you how they work. All right, the network as a platform. So this is where we're gonna be talking about converged networks. So in the past, we had, um, we had our phone networks, our computer networks, and our broadcast network. So this is video, this is voice, this is data, okay? And so the problem with separating them all is I, they're, they're expensive, right? You have to buy different equipment for each one. And so a converged network is where we actually, they're going all through the same switched network. And so we have data coming through, voice coming through, and video coming through. And so in that way we can we don't have to pay the people to manage all three. Uh, we have less people managing less devices, and so it's much more affordable in that way. Um, and so in the same way that we converge all this stuff, um, we bring the world together. We can online game, video conference, call people from different countries and I don't know this guy can read the news 
reliable network. So now we're going to go into design. Okay, so fault tolerance. What fault tolerance is, is the ability to recover from something failing. And so we want redundancy. So in this picture, um, as you can see, we have a redundant connection going across. And so if this router fails, we can still get to the internet. Whereas if we did not have this redundant connection, uh, we would not, this entire network would be kicked off the internet. All right, so scalability. And so what that means is that we can expand. And so we build these networks to be fault tolerant, right? That's that's what a good net, a good network is fault tolerant. It's scalable, it has quality of service, and it's secure, all right? So scalability means that once we start buying these expensive items, we don't have to rip them out when we wanna go bigger, that we can just scale on, on top of them and build our network better. And that's why uh, people pay people to design networks is so that the network is not flat, that it is tiered and hierarchical, so we can scale. So we have, oops, we have quality of service, okay, and so what quality of service is doing is it's saying, hey, these phones are going to take up a lot of bandwidth, and so the phone needs to have a higher priority being sent across the network than this computer going to a web server. And so that's what QoS, quality of service says, hey, you have first priority if you're sending traffic, you have second priority, you have third. And finally, security. Um, security, this is where we're probably putting in firewalls and we're keeping people from logging this out. Uh, we're scanning the network for malicious attacks and that kind of thing. All right, so fault tolerance and circuit switch networks. Okay, so a circuit switch network is a lot like our old 56K. Now, or, or uh, our T1s and, and that kind of thing, they actually form a circuit. And so what I mean by forming a circuit is, as we'll see in a, a switch network is much different from a circuit switch network. So this is like the what we call the public switch telephone network or they're just saying the telephone no network and so when we make a phone call right we dial a number we dial I don't know when you call your mom your telephone goes through the telephone network it goes through the switch and it forms a circuit this is a circuit so it goes straight all data is going straight to wherever you're going. And we have some internet technologies that still use this. But it doesn't take a separate path. The circuit is formed and it's going to take that path. Now, whereas we have a switch network, it actually, so it sends packets, and these packets can be sent in different they can be load balanced across different lines and sent in different directions. It doesn't necessarily mean that, remember in our phone, we went in a straight line. This one, it says, hey, this line's getting busy. How about we send some of them this way? How about we send some of them that way? And so it can be switched around. And so now with the fault tolerance, we have redundant connections so that if any line goes down, we still have uptime in our network. Same with over here. We have uptime in our network. All right, so our scalability. Um, I don't know why we're talking about ISPs here. Okay, so we'll start off with ISPs. So we have three tiers of ISPs, and they run, they connect, a tier one ISP connects countries, basically. So, um, and like this says, tier one ISPs provide national and international connections. And so they're going global. So when we're talking about tier one, it's global. Now we're going down to a smaller one. All right. So this would be more like cable one. So tier two ISPs, they're smaller. They provide regional service. So they're not like cable one's not just in Lewiston. It is in Arizona, Boise, I don't know where all. McCall. So 
it's it's a regional. It's it's all over the place. So it's more of a tier two ISP. Now it's not going globally, but it is going across regions. So that's a tier two ISP. So tier two ISPs connect to tier one, and they rent resources to go across there. And then we have our local ISPs, stuff like I don't know, in Lewiston, Rodeo or First Step, where they're basically just in a town connecting these, and so they're running. They connect to tier two ISPs, which then connect to tier one, and this is how the internet is built. Um, all right, so now QoS and converged networks. They require QoS because before, remember, they're all separated. We didn't have to worry about stuff, but now they're all together. And so some stuff like VoIP and video is going to take up a whole lot more than web and email, right? And so we need QoS in these converged networks, right? And so as you can see here, it's giving the VoIP high priority, the financial transactions medium priority because you probably want those to go through before somebody is going to Facebook, right? So our web page is then on our low priority. And so as you can see, the high priority and medium priority are being sent before our poor little guy who's trying to get to Facebook. Providing network security. All right. So network security. I don't know what they just a so they're saying what we want to protect from. Okay, so network outages. Okay, this is called a denial of service attack. So network outages is that prevent communications and transactions from occurring with consequent loss of business. Because, so denial of service, uh, they take off, I don't know, they take down, they wouldn't take down Amazon because it's too big, but say they took down Amazon, Amazon loses capital because the network is down. Um, other things that could be stolen because we are using weak network security is intellectual property. So if you're someone like uh, Schweitzer or some college that's a research uh, building, I don't know, a nuclear generator or something, you kind of want to keep that because uh, if another business or another country steals that, it, it, it could be bad for you, right? You, you've wasted all this capital generating this intellectual property and then you lose it. Um, personal or private information can be compromised, misdirection, or loss of personal business funds so they can steal your money, or loss of important data that takes a significant labor to replace or is irreplaceable, right? So um, how do we fix them? Access policies, we'll learn about that as we go through CCNA, firewalls, and data encryption. All right. So, new trends in networking. I will let you guys read through that, but we get to BYOD, or bring your own device. And so what BYOD, it doesn't mean that you just come to LCSE and connect to the wireless and that's BYOD. What BYOD actually does is you bring a device and then it says, hey, okay, so you're a contractor and so you access all of the resources on the servers for a contractor. So that's what BYOD is. So all the resources, or you're a student. And so here's your student chairs and you can share to these classrooms and that would be what BYOD did. Any device you bring, put it on the network, it detects you and puts you with the access to what you need. It's not just a wireless network. Online collaboration. Um, well, you probably know about these. Uh, be online meetings, uh, talking to customers, whatever. So we, with online collaboration, we improve customer satisfaction, increase communication choices. Optimize team performance, enable mobile users, improve organizational communications, and transport training and event management, right? You can do training just like this. Uh, you can talk to anyone anywhere very easily. You can work from your laptop in an airport. You can 
I would say that goes with optimized team performance as well. I don't know. So the communication and enable mobile users, I believe, is similar to optimizing team performance. Um, same with in increased communication choice and customer satisfaction. Okay, so video communication. Well, you guys probably have experienced this before. I Hopefully you use Skype or... Uh, let's see what else I'm just going to Skype right now because FaceTime any of those but uh, feel free to read through uh, these if you want so now we get to cloud computing and so it's something we hear all the time we don't hear about the cloud and so like I said the cloud is a network that we can't define and so what is cloud computing um, well there's different types of cloud computing but basically what it's doing is instead of building data centers we can go through something like Microsoft Azure or Amazon web services also known as AWS and we can rent as much RAM and processing power as we need or we can use something like Microsoft Office 365 like and you guys all have that free through the college so hopefully you know what I'm talking about but and that's called software as a service where we're going to the internet to and a server on the internet is giving us our application say word or powerpoint or whatever it is that's software as a service um, whereas we could do infrastructure or platform as a service which is where we're actually our data center is located where we're programming our applications running our web servers and that's cloud computing or we can do this hybrid cloud um, where it's kind of private like half of our data center is running but we have a backup in the cloud we have a private cloud which means we can just access our data center from anywhere but not everyone can our public cloud would be stuff like Google Drive um, yeah so it's not just storage like Google Drive it's actual virtual computing power data centers all right, so a data center is just a bunch of servers, and so what we want is redundant data communication connections, high-speed virtual servers, redundant storage systems, typically use a SAN technology, redundant or backup power supplies, environmental controls. So basically you can look at this as like LCSC's website is ran in a data center. Um, I don't believe anymore that Blackboard is, but Blackboard used to be all these... LCS has all these applications that are running on these servers and so why do we need redundant power and virtual servers well virtual servers means we can have a ton of servers in a small space um, so we can have if one server crashes we still have others so we we're trying to get with our network and our servers we want 99.99 percent uptime that's that's four nines after the 99 and so that's what we're doing in our data centers um, which a lot of that is being farmed out to cloud now but the cloud is a data center somewhere so still jobs in it technology and home trends alright so we can use cloud storage uh, hopefully you guys have seen that if not I encourage you to use OneDrive uh, Google Drive, wow that was hard to think of, or anything in between. It's I guess uh, iCloud, all those are cloud storages where it's kind of cloud computing but it's not, we're not actually using hard drive, we're just using storage. Um, there's power line networking and so what power line networking is, is we put these adapters in and they extend our wireless service through our built-in um, power lines already. Wireless broadband, which is wireless ISP service providers. So if you live in rural areas such as Grangeville, like myself, you probably, unless you live in town, you probably have to use a wireless internet service provider of some po point. And so Wireless ISPs, it probably doesn't say this here, but they use bigger access points 
than your home, and they're usually a point to multi point. And well, I'm not going to go that far. We'll, we'll learn about it in the future, but they're using either uh, 80211, which is the same as your home networking, or 80216, which is known as uh, it's uh, LTE or WiMAX. So, anyhow. Security threats. Alright, so hopefully you've heard of some of these things. Viruses, worms, and Trojan horse, which are malicious software with arbitrary codes, spyware and adware, zero day attacks, hacker attacks, denial of service attacks, data interception and theft, and identity theft. So, viruses, all these, so a virus is, I'm just going to give you a simple explanation, you're going to learn more about it, and security plus or security awareness. Virus is basically just a program that is running itself, okay? It's, it's just solely made to crash something or infect you. A worm is a network virus that spreads over network vulnerabilities. Um, a Trojan is a computer program that, say you want to download a free copy of I don't know you you want a key cracker for some software so you download that and it gives you a key cracker but behind that key cracker it also loaded in a backdoor that allows hackers to watch everything you're doing take screenshots of your of your screen and do uh, have a key logger to watch all your everything you're typing so they can steal your passwords and everything else so then we have spyware, software installed on a user device that it secretly contains information about the user. So spyware is usually just tracking you and sending ads or sending you to malicious links, something like that. Hacker attacks, I think that explains itself. Denial of service is when we try to crash someone so that they can't use their network. Data interception, we usually call this a man in the middle. It's where I'm trying to steal your passwords. Um, I sit in the middle of your network and watch everything you're doing and then steal it. Identity theft, I think that's explains itself. All right, so security solutions. Well, anti antiviruses and firewall filtering for home. Um, you could have a dedicated firewall system, probably a hardware. What they're talking about is a hardware uh, firewall. Um, access control list. What an access control list says is it's kind of like a list of people who can get into a club, except it's for programs or computer protocols. And so if you're not on the list, you can't get in. IPS, intrusion prevention systems, uh, they are scanning your network to identify fast spreading threats such as a zero day or zero hour attack, which I didn't say that, but that's something that, that's an attack that hasn't happened yet. It's, it's using a vulnerability before anything else. Um, and then you can use VPNs. And so VPNs are virtual private networks. And what they do is they encrypt your traffic across the internet and make your computer think that it's connected to, say, your business, your home, something. And you can securely ac access your resources through VPNs. All right, network architecture. This one, I think we're going to go into... Oh, so we are... This is just talking about the CCNA. All right, so the CCNA is an associate, right? So it's up on this level right here. So at the end of CCNA 1 through 4, you will take this test, and hopefully you will become an associate. Um, at the end of CCNA 2, you will take the CSENT, um, which is the Cisco Certified Entry Network Technician. CCNA is Cisco Certified Network Associate. Um, if you keep going, you can become a Cisco Certified Network Professional. Um, it's a lot of fun. And, yeah, at that point, you can become a CCIE. And the brand new one is CCIA 
or Cisco Architect, which is extremely rare. Um, and I haven't even looked how much that test costs. To become an expert, I think it costs about $2,000 nowadays. Um, and most people fail that test the first time. So, anyhow, why is that important? Uh, Cisco vendors uh, need a certain amount of certified people at different levels to offer certain solutions and to be a, I don't know, platinum, gold, or silver vendor. Uh, and so it, it also, they're pretty hard tests, and so they make you look pretty good, help you get jobs, and help, your, help you prove your expertise. Okay, so that was the chapter. Um, if you have any questions, please post it in the classroom discussion or send me an email. Um, I hope you enjoyed it.